Thank you so much, Catherine. I feel like I'm in sacred space. This is so gorgeous. I thank all of you for coming today. It's just so wonderful to see you. Before I start, I just want to say one thing. A few years ago, I was at a conference where um, a woman put her whole presentation on slides so that I was able to read what she was saying and hear what she was saying, and it helped me a lot, and ever since then I've been doing the same thing. So if you see a lot of writing on the slides, that's, that's why. So today I'm talking about the degeneration of the divine feminine, the degeneration of prehistoric divine female figures into historic age witches and monsters. As you all probably know, there are great differences between most of the cultures on our planet today and the cultures five to 9,000 years ago, especially differences in the functionality and the valuing of women. These are some of the cultures of Neolithic Europe that were very high cultures, as I'll tell you in, in a minute. Um, especially Southeast Europe had a, just a wonderful civilization. The divine was mostly represented by the feminine. Among the thousands of figurines excavated from Europe and Turkey, dating to the Neolithic, female figurines outnumbered male figurines 10 to 1. The female, as we will see th throughout these slides, represented the entire life continuum, birth, death, and regeneration. As such, she was a paradox. She was a unity as well as a multiplicity. And she was often shown as bird, woman, snake woman, or a hybrid of the two. I'm attempting to extract from pre-patriarchal material culture lessons which we can apply in order to construct a spiritual view which speaks to our time. This is a spirituality of wholeness, similar to the spiritual system embraced by ancient women and men. So we look to ancient iconography for an integrating message for the present time. And I just want to ask before I go on, am I the right distance from the microphone? Is this okay for you? Okay. Yes? Okay, thank you. In the Neolithic, in Europe and the Near East, from about 7,000 BCE to about 4,000 BCE, Many cultures were matriarchal, and that's in the relatively recent, say within the last 20 years, definition of matriarchal. Um, the first part is uh, from the word mother, and the second part used to, it, it can mean either rule by, but it can also be at the beginning, origin. So we now think of it as instead of rule by the mothers, which it certainly wasn't, we think of it as the mother at the, the, the mother's values at the center of the culture. So the cultures have nurturing values. They were matrifocal, center, centered upon the mother, matrilineal, so descent was traced through the mother line, and matrilocal, where the male would come to live with the mate's relatives. This, um, this was common, this may not have been throughout Europe and the Near East, but it was common, for example, at the central Anatolian site of Chatelhuyuk, DNA studies were done on the females and the males. The females were related and the males were not. So this is also exogamy. They were sedentary, they lived in houses which were often brightly decorated. They practiced horticulture rather than full-scale agriculture, which means they weren't growing food in order to sell it, they were growing it in order to eat it. There's no evidence of the sorts of weapons which could be 
used to kill other humans, weapons such as daggers. There were things like spears because they were hunters, but there were no hill forts, no defensive structure, no evidence of war. A writing system, which is still undeciphered, the Danube script, appears on pottery and figurines. And here we see, you can see that, you can see that um, character right where her womb would be. This is a, a bird figure with old European or Danube script and uh, obviously before and after restoration. They had beautiful pottery. If you look at the swirling lines and gorgeous colors. Well then, under patriarchy things changed. Most cultures for the past few thousand years, I would say at least 4,000, have been patriarchal with the, the way Arche was used in origin, they were ruled, there, there was rule by men. They were patrilineal, inheriting through the male line, except for a few cultures like the, the old Irish, which had patch, matra patrilineal inheritance. They were often misogynistic and they were warrior cultures, making war with the goal of taking over the territories and goods, human and otherwise, of others in order to enrich themselves. So, they became more selfish. So I'm, I'll talk for a few minutes about the origins of patriarchy among in Europe and places where the Indo-Europeans went. So around 4500 BCE, groups of people whom we call the Proto-Indo-Europeans migrated in three waves from the grassy and forested steppe areas north of the Black and Caspian Sea, so this area. And in later stages, they, probably by 3000 BCE, they had domesticated the horse. This is including to the very latest research. And so they rode on horseback. At the time of the third and last wave, and these waves were first described by the um, Lithuanian archaeologist Maria Gambutas, whom I'll talk about in, the, in a moment. They were described um, by her in the 50s, and now DNA evidence has proved her correct. So at the time of the, the last wave, which was about 2800 BCE, Simultaneously throughout Europe and south to India and Iran, north to uh, Chinese Turkestan, there is evidence of great change. Male deities are now depicted in great abundance. Major sites are heavily fortified, that's a clue. Beautiful ceramic art disappears. There's no writing system and weapons proliferate. Whereas bur burials had been communal throughout Europe during the, the earlier Neolithic, now there were extravagant burials in mounds in, in Russian called kurgans, uh, with the chieftain at, at the center and often sacrificed humans and animals accompanying them and they were very rich in grave goods. So there were chieftain burials. Maria Gambutas, a Lithuanian archaeologist and Indo-Europeanist, first coined the word Kurgan people for the peoples of the steppes. She taught at UCLA, and I was very fortunate that she had herself put on my doctoral dissertation committee. When she wanted to do something, she always did it. <laughs> she wrote extensively about Neolithic European iconography, which she found as she excavated hundreds of female figurines herself especially bird and snake female figurines. And here she is when she was younger. Here she is in the Boyne River Valley in Ireland where um, Star and I were fortunate enough to go with her. The Proto-Indo-Europeans were semi-nomadic pastoralists, so they would move to locate from location to location following good pasture land for their herds. 
As they migrated, they sometimes assimilated with and sometimes conquered the more sedentary peoples they encountered. The newly assimilated peoples, so the old Europeans and the Proto-Indo-Europeans, they assimilated and they became what we know of as the Indo-Europeans. Their religion became male-centered but hybrid. The Proto-Indo-European languages were the ones that survived, while the Neolithic languages survived in just a few, some words, often place names like Corinth. NTH is not Indo-European. So they became the ancestors, the Greeks, Romans, Iranians, some peoples of India, Balts, Slavs, Hittites, Irish, Welsh, British, Germanic peoples, among others. And here, this is a a map of the, of the Indo-European languages which were inherited. There were some early dialects of uh, Proto-Indo-European. These evolved into so many languages and most of the languages spoken in Europe and the New World today. So DNA evidence tells us that it was the males who migrated out of the Indo-European homeland because their R1A and R1B Y chromosomes almost completely supplant, uh, took over from the, the Neolithic, the earlier Indo-European male DNA. So the earlier Indo-European males were wiped out. They were not procreating, procreating. My hypothesis is that they were young males full of testosterone and more patriarchal than the peoples they left behind because interestingly, uh, the functionality of women in the Indo-European homeland uh, is, was greater than that in the, um, in the places where the, the young men went. So in the homeland, say in what is now Ukraine, women could be priestesses and warriors in, um, in the, throughout Europe where the, the proto-Indo-Europeans proto went, they were mostly private. They, they were mostly not in, in public, so kept in the home. The, the greatest honor was, was placed on young male warriors, and here we see Achilles with, in full warrior regalia. Hill forts appear among the sedentary peoples, indicating cultures which now needed defense against people who were attacking them. Over time, the myths of the old Europeans were changed to reflect the values of the Proto-Indo-European steppe peoples. The concept, especially, of the circle of birth, death, and regeneration slowly turned into a linear concept of life and death, with life being honored and death feared and dishonored. Many reflections of the divine feminine became demonized into monsters if they re represented an aspect of death and if they weren't um, giving some special uh, functions to their civilizations. So great goddesses such as the Greek Athena weren't demonized, but they, all, they often became spokes goddesses for the patriarchy and most of them were subsumed under patriarchy. So first we will look at the prehistoric past. So as I said, thousands of female figurines dating to the early Neolithic, the early mid and late, um, were produced and archeologists have found them in both burial and domestic contexts. So this figure, for example, she's in the, the Ankara Museum and she's about this size, she's rather large. She's on a leopard throne and she was found in a grain bin, so she was protecting the grain. The goddess protects the grain, the pottery, the weaving. She protects the, the dead in burials and 
because she represents the great round of birth, death, and regeneration, she leads the death into new life. Many tombs show evidence of ritual celebrations and that the tomb was also the womb, the path into rebirth. And now we're going to look at some bird women, snake women, and bird snake women. And again, they're manifesting the realms of birth, death, and regeneration. The goddess was both an integral whole and a multifunctional being with many attributes and functions and probably names. The Balkans have uh, produced just thousands of bird snake figures. This is from northern, uh, northern Greece, Thessaly. And you notice that these bird figures have beaky noses and huge eyes. Whatever else they have, that seems to be almost a constant. This figure is from the Vinca culture in Serbia, which was a very high culture. And notice, she has a beaky nose, large eyes, stumpy arms, and they also had very interesting indication of, uh, of dress, uh, this skirt, for example. They also, hmm, hmm. No, I'll switch. <laughs> you see this meander? Uh, the meander was either a right side up or an upside down V, and you know what the, the V is for. And um, this is found on a lot of the figures. Oh, sorry, chevrons, not meanders. They also were decorated with meanders. Another Vincia bird figure from Serbia. This is from Prague, and you notice this figure has sort of a, a beaky face, and, and the, but the, the facial attributes aren't much shown and stumpy arms, and a very large pubic triangle, which is also very common. From Bulgaria, we see a figure with a chevron around her neck and a beaky nose, large eyes. Now, these particular figures I um, have been thinking about a lot, and this last several months as I was um, preparing for this, I started thinking about it more. She has stumpy arms, so she is a bird figure, but she has a sort of snaky or phallic neck, and she has incisions, circular incisions, on the whole part of her body. So I'm thinking she's bird snake, and there's so many of these found. Another one of these. Um, these are, are mostly from northeastern Romania into Ukraine. And notice the stumpy arms. This figure from the southeast Aegean, um, we, can, we can see how she is reconstructed, um, has a beaky nose, uh, stumpy arms, small breasts ind indicative of a young woman at a very large pubic triangle. A class of tomb figures were the cycladic figurines. They were stiff, wide nudes found in graves throughout the cycladic islands in the Aegean Sea, and similar figures were found in the Near East and Western Europe, other parts of Western Europe. So you see this figure, she's in the British Museum and she's almost 20 inches high. And notice the face is a, more of a mask, beaky nose, the arms are now under her breasts in a resting position, uh, small breasts 
and a very large pubic triangle. Okay, so this is deaf, but look at this one. She has the same stiff nude iconography as the other one, but the only difference is that she's pregnant. And this isn't a figurine depicting the person in the grave because she's stylized. This figure represents rebirth, again, in the cycle of birth, death, and regeneration. So these figures probably represent the bird of death who guards the tomb. And a pregnant death goddess isn't surprising when we realize that the goddess of death was also the goddess of life beyond death. In the Sumerian myth, the descent of Inanna, the great goddess of the underworld, sort of a precursor, a much more powerful precursor to Persephone, Ereshkigal is giving birth the death goddess brings new life. In the descent of Inanna, when the little empathetic creatures, the Kurgaru and the Kalaturu, come about upon Ereshkigal, came upon Ereshkigal, they found, and I've, um, because this is my passion, I've translated some, some pieces that I include here. Um, and I also, I translate very literally because I want you to be able, I don't want to stylize because I want you to know the, the meaning of, of the words as much as possible, uh, that, the intended meaning of the words. So, the mother giving birth to infancy, Ereshkigal, she has ha hair on her head like leeks, reminds you of Medusa. <laughs> She says, ouch, my insides. And the little empathetic creatures say, ouch, your insides. And she says, ouch, my outsides. And she, they say, ouch, your outsides. And they're empathizing with her. And because of that, Eresh Kigal allows Inanna to return to the upper world. And I'll talk about that again in a moment. But we see she is giving birth to infancy. The death goddess is giving birth. Here's another um, not cycladic figure. This is from Western Turkey, Western Anatolia. And she, just in case you weren't positive the others were bird goddesses, she has a beaky nose and more winged arms and a huge pubic triangle. From Troy were found bird-faced pots with breasts the um, arms are upraised like wings. There's a beaky nose, large eyes, and very large brow ridges, as you see, small breasts. And um, these would have held grains and other materials. I wondered if maybe they held, held um, cremation ashes, but it, um, it doesn't seem like most of them do. This is a rather late figure to be still a, a female with female breasts, and, but also a bird, so a hybrid. And you can see that this, by the stripes, it's really probably representing wings with her up, upraised arms and large eyes, beaky nose, no mouth, and then um, bird legs. So um, when we get later into the Bronze Age, we find woman associated with birds rather than woman as bird. So the Neolithic imagery is assimilated with Indo-European values. The figurines are more anthropomorphic, more human. Bird imagery continues for a very long time in, throughout the historic era. This is a typical Mycenaean female figure. She's gold, and she has three birds over her head. And next to her in the National Archaeological Museum was one who had a bird over her head, but it's still woman as separate from bird, but associated with birds. We see uh, pot sherds and, and other indicators of um, bird imagery in Italy. And some of the, the eyes 
we think their eyes look like spirals. So indeed, the, as the spirals become stylized, they may represent bird eyes. This is a very interesting figure. So large-eyed and spiral-eyed figures probably represent the owl form of the goddess. She's the protectress of the dead who would return to her womb, and, but she's the cause of death herself. And her symbols are carved on orthostats, curbstones, and capstones at megalithic grave sites throughout Western Europe. So here we see these fantastic images on a capstone from Lau Cru, Ireland. Just as there is uh, bird imagery attached to female figures, so is snake imagery attached. And you see these painted lines, circular lines, throughout the whole body. That's what's making me think that the figurines from northeastern Romania are, are snakes as well as birds, because the snake figures almost always have these circular lines. I love this figure. She's in a half lotus position. <laughs> But notice she too has circles or rings around her arms and legs. She also has a headdress. In, um, in archaeology books, we'll often uh, refer to a polos, which is the Greek word for headdress. Whether or not they come from Greece. This one is from the Sesklo culture, northern Greece. It's a kurotrophos. It means a nurturer of a child. So it's a, a woman nurturing a baby. And again, with, with the, the spiral, circular lines or rings. And um, the heads are missing from the mother and the baby. I thought I'd show this again just to show how similar these um, incisions on, throughout the body are to the, the incisions on the snake figures. This is a wonderful snakey. She too is, is a kurotrophos, a mother nursing a child, holding and nursing a child. You can't miss the snakey head. And she has this headdress and then either um, a large pubic triangle or some kind of um, almost not their clothing. From Agia Nikolaios in eastern Crete, this is a snake pot, it's a libation vase. And notice the snaky, or again phallic, but probably snaky head. She has um, tiny breasts and a cross hatched large pubic triangle. And, and checkering, cross-hatching on the rest of her body. This one uh, shows everything. So she has the large brow ridge of the bird goddess, large eyes, beaky nose, no mouth, a snake around her shoulders, so she's bird snake. In the middle, she has what might be the labrys, and she has sheaves of wheat on the side. So she's probably everything. I include this because I love it. I love the little snake. And this is obviously a ritual vessel since it wouldn't have held liquid. Well, in the early historic era, after 3000 BCE in the Near East, the woman is accompanied by snakes, just as the later female figures are, bird female figures are accompanied by birds. So this is from Ugarit in uh, Syria, very uh, close to the Turkish border. And she has a snake wrapped around her shoulders. So I've spent a really long time trying to think of why birds and snakes would be associated with the goddess and therefore why they would be divine. And I've come up with a few things. And if anybody has even more ideas, I'd love to hear them. So 
both bird and snake lay eggs. And this is a powerful visual symbol of birth. Birds can represent the breath of life, but raptors obviously cause death, um, and they personify death. They also personify night, like owls, night, night animals, night birds. And raptors have to kill to eat. Crows, as well as raptors, are associated with the battlefield and myths. And in Baltic myth, the cuckoo, as Maria Gimbutas writes, sometimes represents the dead mother. Snakes slough their skin. Birds molt and then grow feathers again. This is regeneration. And the phoenix dies and is reborn out of its ashes. Poisonous snakes represent death but their venom can also be used as antitoxin, so they also represent health and regeneration, and the snake was associated with healing. Here is the Roman goddess of health, Hygieia, with a snake. And here's the caduceus. On the left, we have a snake wrapped around the pole, but on the right, the snakes look like a double helix. And not only that, but the, but the pole is, has wings as well. So we have bird snake. Birds mediate heaven and earth. Snakes mediate earth and the underworld. So if you're a psychopomp helping to lead, lead people to, um, I, don't, I don't have a concept of, of hell, I don't have a negative concept, but the underworld, then you are a snake person. So then we come to some early historic female figures associated with birds and snakes. So in the early historic era, in many places, life and death ceased to be understood as a continuum worthy of equal veneration. In her beneficent, life-giving aspect, the goddess continued in the historic eras to be worshipped and revered, whereas in her death-bringing aspect, she often metamorphosed into witch or monster. First, we have the goddesses who, revered, who were re still revered in their cultures. So, for example, the Sumerian goddess Inanna represented love, and she, was, she became Ishtar, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, and even Hittite. And this is my favorite figurine in the whole world. This is um, a little... Inanna. Uh, she is alabaster uh, with gold and, and rubies. And when we were, when my husband Greg and I were um, photographing for my first book, when we were in the Louvre, um, I asked in advance for the figures. And the curator, uh, the Near Eastern curator, took us into the walls of the Louvre and we found her in a pile of figures buried underneath some more figures. Well, we cleaned her up and photographed her. Inanna has wings, as you can see here. She was associated with death on the battlefield, and uh, so Sumerian culture was patriarchal. It was just a little bit more balanced spiritually than um, the later, um, like the Greco-Roman cultures. She flies about the battlefield. In the vanguard of the battle, everything is beset by you. My lady, flying about on your own wings, you feed on the carnage. And she was also associated with ferocious natural phenomena such as the loud thundering storm. She won most of the attributes of civilization in, in Sumer, the May, from the water and wisdom god Enki, her uncle Enki. So here is Inanna 
and here's Uncle Enki. Or is it? Yeah, because he's on water. So she won the attributes from in a drinking contest. She drank them under the table, took all the may with her, and after that she had charge over law, justice, judgment, priesthood, priestesshood, wisdom, prophecy, love, and many more. As I said before, she descended to the underworld, was rescued by Enki and the little empathetic creatures and returned to the upper world. So she was reborn. She died and, and was regenerated. Similar to Inanna uh, and, uh, was uh, the Semitic Anat. She was worshiped by the Syrians and others and she was, uh, represented both love and war and she could change herself into a bird and you see here her wings. But interestingly, I think they must have borrowed this from Egypt. There's a little snake peeking out of her headdress. And in Egypt, as we'll see in a few minutes, um, uh, in the headdress of, of divinities and, and pharaohs and others, uh, there's always the Urias, the snake, um, which represents infinity. And we're told in the hymn to Anat, Anat violently slays the sons of two cities. She hews the people of the seashore. She destroys the people of the rising sun. Under her, heads fly like locusts. This is gross. Over her, hands fly like locusts. She wades knee deep in blood. Anat exults. So the Semitic cultures were pretty patriarchal as were the Indo-Europeans. Lilith, the Sumerian Lil bird, Akkadian Babylonian Lilitu, and Hebrew Lilith are all forms of the same goddess figure. In Hebrew, her name means a nocturnal specter, but probably a screech owl, so she was a predatory bird. This is the queen of the night relief, from the British Museum. Notice that her wings are pointed down and that's pointing to the underworld. So other people had tried to identify her as, for example, Ishtar, but she can't be because she's not because she is an underworld figure. She has vulture's claws and she's accompanied by the owl and also flanked by lions. In the Sumerian poem, the Halupu tree, and this dates to about 2000, so it's quite late Sumerian, the Lil, the Anzu bird, and a snake make their home in Inanna's Halupu tree. Inanna wants them to leave because she wants to cut down the tree and make a bed and a throne from the wood. Now her powers were already diminishing by the time this poem was written. So it's the hero, King Gilgamesh, who smashes the snake in the Anzu bird and Leel leaves. So here we see the beginnings of the patriarchal overthrow of the goddess and the bird and the snake. Isis, look at her gorgeous wings. Here she is in the underworld, stretching out her wings to create breath for the dead, especially her husband, Osiris, who was murdered by his brother. And she's also, she's found in tombs, she's also found on uh, sarcophagi. And she says, I come so that I might be as a protection for you. So she protects the dead. This is the Urias, the snake which in circular form represents the eternal infinity. And it's the symbol of lower or northern Egypt. It took me a while to get used to this concept. Lower is the north and upper is the south. And it doesn't work for me, but that's the way it is. <laughs> Nekvet is the vulture goddess, so we had snake, now we have bird, of upper or southern Egypt. 
and she stretches out her wings. So the bird and the snake were integral to the iconography of ancient Egypt. Okay, now um, Greco-Roman goddesses, many of them, many of the great goddesses have this bird and snake imagery, but they're associated with birds and snakes rather than being birds and snakes. So here we have Aphrodite riding on a goose and the wings are those of the goose. And Aphrodite and her son Eros on a swan or goose. Here is the uh, crouching Aphrodite over four, four feet tall in the British Museum. This is a Roman marble copy. And notice there is a snake wound around her arm. And just in, in case that doesn't convince you it's a snake, here is a, another copy in, in the John Paul Getty Museum. And you can really tell that it's a snake. Athena. Bright-eyed Athena departed, having the appearance of a sea eagle, as Homer tells us in the Odyssey. So her major symbol was the owl, so the, the night and death aspect of the goddess. And you look at this coin, it, you have Athena on the, on the obverse, and you have the owl on the reverse, but the owl is Athena because this is A-T-H-E. So it's all Athena. So the snake again is death and regeneration. And here is Athena in a grouping from the Gigantomachy, the war between the, the, the gods and, and the giants. This um, is now in the British Museum. Oh, sorry, in the Acropolis Museum. And here's a close-up so you can really see the little snake head. And also there are these sort of snaky circular things in her headdress. This is a reconstruction of the now lost golden ivory Athena Parthenos. It was supposedly 37 feet high. It shows the winged Nike in her right hand with Erichthonius, the um, early king serpent of Athens, in her, so here's Nike, which means victory, so it's Athena's victory. Here's Erichthonius in her shield, and on her breastplate is Medusa. This is a small copy of the Athena Parthenos, and you see she has a serpent around her waist, and she has um, Medusa again in her breastplate. And here's a detail of Erichthonius. Now, he's the good snake because he uh, supported Athens. So Athena uh, inserted the head of Medusa into her breastplate after Perseus beheaded Medusa. And we'll talk about him again in a minute. I consider him an anti-hero. Here's Medusa in the Aegis. And notice that her head is winged instead of snaky. So it's almost like the, the two um, are, are in complementary distribution. The pseudo Apollodorus described Athena as Medusa's enemy. It's said by some that Medusa was beheaded because of Athena. They say that, in fact, the Gorgon wished to compare herself to her, to Athena, in regard to beauty. So we're bringing out competitiveness, of course, between women rather than cooperation. So Athena was the companion of the snake, Erichthonius, 
the guardian serpent of Athens, but she battled the destructive snake Enceladus, and of course she always wins. Here is Hera on a gold ring. I couldn't find bird or snake images of her, but Homer in the Iliad says, then Athena and Hera went forth with steps resembling those of shy doves. And in Hera's sanctuaries have been found votive offerings, which include terracotta snakes. Demeter, the grain goddess, instructed Triptolemus, a young man of Eleusis, in the, way, in the ways of agriculture, and she gave him a winged, winged serpent-drawn chariot so that he could spread this knowledge across the earth. So here he is in his chariot. Here she is, holding sheaves of wheat, poppies, and snakes. And here she is in a on a panther with a snake around her shoulders. Artemis, we mostly know as a huntress responsible for the animals, including the death of animals. In Homer's Odyssey, though, Penelope, in her longing for her long up absent husband Odysseus, and that would be Roman Ulysses, cried out to the goddess, Artemis, august goddess, daughter of Zeus, if only now you would cast your arrow in my breast and take away my life at once. So, responsible for human death, but also for human childbirth, because mothers in labor called upon her as Artemis Eletheia. So, birth and death. And here she is winged, flanked by felines maybe lions. Pausanias describes a figure of the, of the Arcadian Artemis. He says, Artemis stands clothed in the skin of a deer, carrying a quiver on her shoulders. In one of her hands, she holds a torch. In the other, two serpents. And this reminds me of these figures that probably all of us know from Minoan Crete in various um, um, attitudes of holding snakes. And this, by the way, is a creation of Arthur Evans, so it was not there. I'd like to think that there was whatever it is there, but it wasn't. Many other classical and earlier female figures are associated with snakes. So um, Hecate was a titan, and so she was not a, an Olympian. She preceded the Olympians, and she was so honored that she receives um, the beginning and end of many prayers. Here she is holding torches and snakes. She was called Trivia. Tree, wea, um, tree is three, wea is uh, roads, so she's the goddess of the three way crossroads. The death bringing aspect of the goddess became, and so apart from these figures we've just looked at, became an object or in a typically fragmented fashion, objects of derision and hatred. So now we're going to look at Greco-Roman monstrous goddesses. So Medusa, again, uh, whose eyes turned to stone anyone who looked on her face. Uh, her hair is snaky, but the wheel vein itself is composed of wings. Here's the Medusa antifix. There are lots and lots and lots of these antifixes. They were ornaments on the eaves of a classical building, but also they were probably apotropaic, probably protecting the, the place and the people in the place. Here's a, what I think is a gorgeous one from Corfu, quite early. And in Corfu, they somehow just did these beautiful 
medusas. This is from the Gorgo pediment uh, from the Doric temple of Artemis. And she just has a couple of snakes at her waist, a couple in her hair, and wings on her lower legs. So the hero Perseus cut off Medusa's head, and the winged horse Pegasus sprang forth from the wound. So the snaky-haired goddess was destroyed, and from her body came the winged horse. But if you look at this terracotta relief from the island of Melos, here he has cut off her head. But here is the goddess with wings, so it, they're her wings. I think differently now when I think of Pegasus. He just borrowed the wings. Okay, so here's Medusa, uh, Medusa beheaded by Perseus. This is a sculpture by Antonio Canova. So the story is that Athena gave Perseus a mirror so he could look in the mirror and not be turned to stone by the gaze of Medusa. Canova omitted the mirror, making us think then that you know he just braved all possible evil and cut off her head. So it rendered Perseus a lot more heroic than he really was. I love this. I don't know if it's still there. Do any of you know if, if she's still at the Metropolitan Museum? I don't. Anyway, this is Luciano Garbati, and it's Medusa holding a sword in the head of Perseus, a role reversal. So this is, I guess, an icon of the Me Too movement, which Star will probably talk about. <laughs> These are fruit furies in Greece, in Greek called Erinyes. They were virgin goddesses who brought punishment for those who killed, especially for those who killed members of their family. They had viper-like hair and wings, so they were bird snakes. And here's one with snakes. Virgil in the Aeneid tells us of, of one of the Furies, at once avenging Tisiphone, equipped with a whip, leaping on the guilty, harasses them, and her left hand brandishing her fierce snakes, she calls on her raging band of sisters. Another fury, Electo, set people on fire, and she was infected with Gorgon's venom, meaning here, snake's venom. Sorry. Her heart loves sad wars, rages, plots, and noxious crimes. She changes herself into so many forms, such fierce shapes. So many black serpents sprout up. So again and again, it's serpents. In the Agamemnon, the first play of Aeschylus's Oresteia, a tragic trilogy of plays, Clytemnestra kills her husband Ag Agamemnon because he's returning from the, the Trojan War with the concubine, and not only that, 10 years earlier, he had sacrificed their daughter Iph Iphigenia in order to bring wind to the sails of the Greek ships. So Clytemnestra has been angry for 10 years at losing her daughter. In the second play of the Oresteia, called The Libation Bearers, Orestes, Agamemnon's and Clytemnestra's son, kills his mother because his mother has killed their father. In the third play of the Oresteia, The Eumenides, Orestes is haunted by the Furies because he's killed his mother. And a tribunal is held to, to determine whether Orestes is guilty or not. And the Furies state that Orestes' murder of his mother was the worst possible shedding of blood because he killed his mother, his closest blood relative, while the man whom Clytemnestra killed was not related by blood. This is matrilineage. And here the Erinyes, the Furies, pursuing Orestes. 
There are so many of these because both modern and ancient artists loved the theme. In defense of Orestes, Apollo in this tribunal counters, the mother of that which is called her, her child is not the parent, but only the nurse of the newly sown embryo. So the mother is nothing but a field to be sown. Then Athena speaks, tipping the balance of the judgment in Orestes' favor. He, she says, it's my duty to render final judgment here. This is a ballot for Orestes I shall cast. There's no mother anywhere who gave me birth, and except for being a patroness of marriage, I'm always on the male side with all my heart and strongly on my father's side. I guess she forgot that her father swallowed her mother Metis, who was wisdom. So in a case where the wife has killed her husband, Lord of the house, and this is found, this phrase is found in several Indo-European um, literary works, ancient literary works, Lord of the house. Her death shall not mean most to me, and if the other votes are even, then Orestes wins. So the Furies are changed into Eumenides, which literally means kind-mindedness, kind-minded ones, sorry. And here we see the Eumenides, Furies made over. The Eumenides are sleeping while Apollo is purifying Orestes with a young pig. So other avian and serpentine monsters. The harpies also embodied characteristics of the bird goddess. So they were Greco-Roman female demons who brought doubt and destroyed hope, and they darted out from blind shadows. And they were both human and bird. She says, these bird, he says, these birds have the faces of young women. The filthiest refuse comes from their belly. They have clawed hands, and their faces are always pale with hunger. And here are some harpies. Now, in the modern era, we um, think of sirens as mermaids, but in the classical era, they were birds. And you see these sirens, almost life-sized, um, women on top, and then you can see their long bird legs and, and claws. And here they are, winged in uh, some decorative handles. Oh, a decorative handle, I think. So they lived on rocky islands, and with their songs, they enticed passing sailors to their destruction. Odysseus was warned by the goddess Circe as he was on his second 10 years of trying to get back home to Ithaca. Um, he had sort of dominated her with a sword, and then she just said, oh, I'll do anything for you, Odysseus. So she warns him, whoever approaches the sirens in ignorance and hears their song, he never returns home. But the sirens enchant him with their clear-toned song as they sit in a meadow, and about them is a large pile of bones of rotting men. But you, row past them, puts honey-sweet wax, which you've softened in your companion's ears. So then the sailors couldn't hear the song, and they didn't crash on the rocks. And Odysseus had himself tied to the ship's mast so that he couldn't jump overboard. And so he had Circe restore his men to their human form. And one of the animals she changed the men into was a pig. So these were the words of the goddess Circe. Circe's niece, the herbalist Medea, helped the hero Jason to steal the golden fleece from her father. And Jason took her with him on his ship, 
and they ended up in Corinth where they had children. And then he thought, you know, I can do better than this. So he made a deal with the king of Corinth to marry the princess, the king's daughter. According to Euripides' tragic play and some other sources, but not all, in retribution, Medea murdered her children. In other myth, Medea then escaped in a chariot drawn by dragons. And you can see that the dragons are bird snakes. So snakes with wings. So these monstrous female figures had the attributes of birds or snakes. Although they continued the personification of the Neolithic European bird and snake goddesses, they were reduced to dire monsters rather than powerful goddesses who ruled over life and death. In the assimilated Indo-European cultures, their potency was held in check. and they were transmuted to various sorts of classical age and later witches and monsters. And although the witches and monsters were powerful, they lacked veneration. And the omnipotence of the goddess, remember Inanna who ha is, has all the attributes of civilization, These are re this omnipotence is reflected in the herbal ma magic of the witch, and this was not an honored witch. Respect and awe were transformed to fear and loathing for these women who had knowledge of herbs and of magic. So just a few other witches. I especially like Baba Yaga, who I think is very similar to the witch in the Hansel and Gretel story. Here's Baba Yaga in her hut, which is on bird legs and has bird claws. Really, she is the hut. She is the bird. The Irish babe was a crow goddess, and she brought death. And the Irish bird goddess, the Morrigan, also could bring death on the battlefield as well as victory. In Indic culture, at death one went, one went into the lap of the Indic crow goddess Nirati. She was also called, though, Sarparajni, queen of the serpents. So she was crow and serpent. She was manifestly the death and regeneration form of the goddess of the life continuum. Lithuanian laumas, or fairies, often have bird legs. I don't have an image. Uh, Baltic witches, Raganus, were also depicted, were often depicted as old evil women, which was silly, although they could at times be beautiful and young as well. A Ragana, we're told, was a flying witch who changes herself into a cat and rides through the air on a ram. Well, according to the Balts, then she was a cat, and other folk beliefs have deemed the cat her companion. And I'm wondering if the tiny feline inherited the jobs, the job of the earlier lions who were companions of the great goddess. And you see Inanna here with her foot on a lion. She is absorbing the power of the lion. The Germanic love goddess Freya was the goddess of love, beauty, fertility, war, and magic. She was the first Valkyrie or spear maiden. The Valkyries were also swan maidens, were, were birds. But by the Middle Ages, here's Freya, transmuted into a witch. She's riding a broom in this medieval cathedral. And here she's riding a feline. Some cultures, not Western ones, have continued to worship the great goddess of life and death and regeneration. Even today, the Indic goddess Devi in all of her manifestations is a very important force in Indic Shakti religion. And in these two images, she's killing the buffalo demon. Although she has 
many manifestations. She's Parvati, Uma, Durga, Kali. She's nonetheless perceived as one goddess as well. In assuming the aspects and functions of other Indic goddesses, she became associated with the epiphanies of the Neolithic bird and snake goddess. She rode in a chariot yoked with swans, and she carried the trident, the moon, and the snake. We can diffuse the herd of the patriarchy with both humor and veneration, so just a little humor, and I really love uh, Medusa. <laughs> I, most of you have probably seen this on Facebook. <laughs> So here's our Medusa protecting our home. She's on the lintel overlooking our living room, and she's from Corfu as well. Uh, they just made just the most exquisite Medusas. Why do I think all of this is important? Although the context which I've given is ancient, our society is facing, as we know, many modern problems as a result of our separation from and fragmentation of the sacred, especially from nature, and dishonoring of the female. We need humor, but we also need to recognize and honor what came before patriarchy and recognize the deeper importance of relating to the past. The fact that there was equalitarian, peaceful, creative life before patriarchy can give us hope that there will be more honoring and harmonious life after patriarchy. Not if, but when we somehow arrive there. We're all interconnected with one another. If we can only recognize the unity of the divine, and I don't mean patriarchal monotheism, and the unity of all life, and realize that we're all connected to one another and with our planet, then through this holistic, harmonious view of our society and our universe, we may be able to restore our lives and our environment to harmony and wholeness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now um, I am giving this back to Catherine. Yes. Hi, everyone. So there's going to be a short intermission, which my film will be playing. Um, feel free to use the restroom, come back, and then star after 28 minutes, star Goody's talk on the vulva from the Paleolithic to now will be next. Thank you so much. <laughs> 